I wasn't one of those kids who dreamed of writing novels when I was eight or 12. I wanted to be a film director. I wanted to make big action movies. I loved movies like Die Hard, Predator, Aliens, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I've always liked actually vehicles in movies. You know, the Batmobiles from the different Batman movies. The DeLorean from Back to the Future. It's all about escapism. It's all about larger than life. It's all about boys' own adventures. If you draw a line through the Star Wars films, through Indiana Jones, Back to the Future, Die Hard, and maybe add in the Jurassic Park films at the end, you pretty much come out the other side with Matthew Wright. He started writing books that were like the movies that he liked to watch. For that to come full circle after all these years and now he finally gets to make the movie, um, I, I'm just really happy for him. I think he deserves it all. I always felt I could come into Hollywood via the story avenue and that's what I did. I've had many more failures and setbacks than successes. But every setback and failure gives you character and it makes the wins all the better. As someone who loves action stories and action movies, I wanted to direct. But nobody would ever let me direct an adaptation of one of my books, because that would cost $100 million. And they don't let a first-time director have that sort of budget. So I wrote this script called Interceptor to be made for somewhere between, say, $5 and $15 million. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Come on in. Come on in. An Australian movie director friend of mine, he said, you have to meet Stuart Beatty. Another Zoom call this afternoon. Oh, yeah. This should be interesting. Talk to Netflix. Yeah. Stu and I hit it off. I sent him Interceptor and said, hey, this is a script I've written. It's designed to be made for a certain budget because I want to direct it. I started reading it, and by page two, I was like, oh, my God, this is great. Yeah. So I called him up and I said, I love it. I absolutely love it. Can I rewrite it? <laughs> he was like, yeah, sure, go for it. And so I, I rewrote it and uh, sent it to him and he was like, love it. It leapt off the page and it was just like, oh, this is fun. Literally in the first page is a guy shot up and bloodied. Yeah. And then you're in and then you don't let him go. Yeah. Uh, Stuart was the one who sent it to producers and he said, this is Matt's script and he wants to direct. And they went, Oh, my God. You know, everyone's always nervous about first-time director because uh, you never know what you're going to get. And we have that as, like, one shot. Yeah, Producers awesome. said, you know, we could get this made if you didn't direct it. And I said, no, I'm directing yeah. it. We could have done something then. Yeah. Financiers came into it and they said, we'd rather not have the first-time director. I said, no, I'm directing it. And they asked me at one point, they said, you know, what have you directed? I said, nothing. <laughs> I said, oh, in university I directed a couple of, you know, crappy little short movies on video with my friends and my brother starring in them. Where the hell is that resident? Here. Back in around 2005, I made a, what I would call a pilot little movie of uh, my book, Contest. Put them on. What was that? It's terrible. You got buddies in here? And I really wish nobody would ever see it, but uh, a buddy of mine put it up on friggin' YouTube. I was trying to get Disney to make Pirates of the Caribbean for 15 years before they finally made it. Um, Collateral was uh, 16 years before that finally got made. You know, you just can never give up, uh, especially on the stories that mean something to you. If you don't have perseverance, then you're never gonna make it. I think it's fair to say writing came about because film directing was not possible. It was only as I was in my late teens that I realised if you're going to make those movies, you need someone to give you 50 or 100 million dollars. And that just wasn't going to happen. Uh, and then I realised by writing a book, I could have all the special effects and all the big blockbuster action I could, I could dream of. And it didn't cost me a cent. I just had to put it on the page. Oh, he likes action-packed. 
I'm amazed at how many ways he can save the world. Matthew's book starts off with a bang and a wallop. We warn everyone, don't read them going to bed because he ends the chapter on a high like the old serials at the movie and you have to keep reading. Hi, I'm Natalie Freer. I'm one of the few people who can claim... Natalie was the first person to read the manuscripts of my books. I met Matthew Riley six years ago. He was just a law student with dreams of writing a best-selling novel. He's now done just that. But you wouldn't believe the way it all happened. When I wrote Contest, Natalie and I had been going out for about six months. Uh, we were going to the same university together, and one day I gave her the first few chapters to read on the bus. And she said, I was worried when you gave it, gave it to me to read because I didn't want it to be terrible. But this is really, really good. This is like a real book. Contest was uh, roundly rejected, and by self-publishing it, I got it into bookstores, where it was ultimately seen by somebody who had some sway. It is literally the longest of long shots that Contest got discovered. But Kate Patterson finds it, documented by Australian Story, many years ago. Hi, oh, Kate Patterson. She calls me and she says, what else are you writing? And I'm 50 pages into Ice Station. I just had an instinct that it wasn't worth waiting for the whole manuscript to be written. And so um, I offered him a two book contract, which he accepted, and the rest is history. Number four this week. Isn't that fantastic yes. in the Sydney Morning Herald? Yes, era? we've moved from fifth to fourth. Um, we've knocked off Geoffrey Archer. I know! <laughs> I'm pleased, I'm pleased. He's got to get rid of Tom Clancy now. <laughs> it is very rare for so nice. an author to have this kind of success. It really only happens in a few percent of cases. Hello, hi. He mostly appeals to male readers, action-adventure male readers. Every book has sold more than the one before, and yeah, they've, all, they've all sold a lot. I met Natalie soon after we signed Matthew up. I went to their engagement party and eventually their wedding. They were devoted to each other. Nat was always there and she believed in Matt and believed that he could do things that, I don't know at what point he believed it too, but the things he wanted to do, she believed he could do it. And she was like, yeah, just do it. Just always behind him. Natalie took a keen interest in the books. I'm very good at plot. I'm very good at putting characters in jeopardy and coming up with outlandish situations. But it was Natalie who would often say, and it was only one thing here, one thing there. What's so-and-so feeling there? You know, what's this? I haven't heard this character speak for 20 pages. Natalie was very good at spotting their emotions and their feelings. And uh, to get her constructive criticism always made the characters better. Natalie and I saw the world together. We'd been together since we were 18 years old. We scuba dived at the Great Barrier Reef together. We went to the base of Mount Everest together. On our honeymoon, we went uh, to Egypt together. We saw Stonehenge together. We pretty much absorbed and grew into the world together. When you're an author, you are isolated. Matthew does an incredible amount of research, but he needed his Natalie to take him out and do other things. Our life together was, was fantastic uh, for, for 15 years. Then at one point, we talked about it. Natalie was working in community mental health as a psychologist, and she wasn't enjoying it. And I said to her, I'm earning enough money for the two of us. If you'd like to stop working, that's OK with me. Uh, and so she did. That's well. That's well. That's well. She got into fitness and she decided that she wanted to run a marathon. And things started to change around that time. You'd be, what, away two weeks or so? Or... We would go to the gym and we'd done that for 10 years. I didn't notice it at first. But slowly she got 
thinner and thinner and the obsession with the healthy eating got more and more. I had that sense that she had lost her joy in a few things and that was a surprise to me because Nat's such a vibrant, joyful person. <laughs> we sat down and, yeah, and Matt and Nat explained that, that she was suffering from depression and that she was, and at that point she was already getting help. The clinical depression had also spawned what I think was an even more malevolent twin, which was anorexia. And then, so it was almost as if she, she turned 33 and a switch was thrown in her brain. The main thing I remember from my first few conversations with Nat about her depression was her just saying, I can't believe it's happening to me. I can't believe this is happening to me. And I agreed with her. I said, I, I can't believe it either. She'd been on uh, one kind of medication and then she'd changed to another and uh, she'd seemed to be on the improve. And she told me that on a certain week that she'd be working. And so I did my touring commitments. You're welcome. But about halfway through that week, we'd always correspond by, by text message or we'd call while I was away. And she didn't answer. And I got home and about 20 minutes after I got home, there was a knock on the door. And there were three policemen at the door and they said that Natalie had killed herself. She was my everything. We did everything together. We'd done everything together for the previous 18 years. My life pretty much fell apart and suddenly I'd have days where I'd look at the clock and it'd be quarter past one in the afternoon and I think, I've got 10 hours till I'm gonna go to bed. I'd take the dog for the longest of walks that you know she's ever had in her life. I cried every day for six months. I howled in my car. Yeah, I think you go through turns of what could you have done? What should you have done? Why did she do what she did? And, and it all counts for naught and you know it. So there's not much you can do except just sit and, and ride through it. Uh, there are some enemies you can't beat. Uh, and in my case, uh, my wife's clinical depression was was an enemy that I couldn't beat. He just didn't see any future. He didn't see any hope. His books are about endless possibility. And I think what Matt experienced with the death of Natalie was, was the closing down of possibility. After Natalie died, Matthew couldn't write. He was lost, very lost. You know, how do you pick up the pieces of your life? How do you, how do you get your confidence again? I, I look at old footage of myself as this young, confident guy. And so I said to myself, let's see if you can travel by yourself. And it was in New York City that I found absolute rock bottom. I was sitting on a platform at Penn Station uh, about to catch a train and I see the train coming down the tracks and a little voice in my head says, Matt, you can take three steps forward right now and all this pain will be over. And the thought horrified me and I I didn't step in front of that train. I, I waited and I got on the train and from that moment I've looked up ever since. I came back and I went and bought myself a whole new wardrobe, new shirts, new jeans, new shoes, totally new. I've rented it a new place, you know, create new surroundings and really asked myself, what is it that I do? And I, I realised what I do is I entertain people. Uh, I entertain with words on a page. And 
it, it wasn't that I decided to sit down and start writing a book. I just had the feeling that I wanted to. It was late in 2012, almost a year to the day after Natalie died. I was very unsure, very tentative. I wasn't sure I'd even managed to get through the first page. But once I did, I was off. It's going to be a different experience writing a book without Natalie reading the pages, you know, as I write them. Uh, I've got to find it. I've got to figure out how to do that without her. Well, Matt was um, good friends with my parents. They've been friends for many years. So Matt was not in a very good place. And so they said, let's invite Matt over for dinner. And it would be great if you could be there to provide some young energy. So a bit quicker to the right of the hole. Thank you. Not that you need my advice. You're a great green I am the better golfer. Go, go. So I didn't see him as this author and I hadn't read any of his books, so I just thought I'll go along to dinner and just see what he's like. But I thought he'd be introverted, possibly boring. But he was great. <laughs> yes. When Kate and I went on our first date, I think I did everything wrong, um, which may mean I actually did everything right. Uh, apparently these days you, you don't pick up uh, the girl, you, you meet at a bar. And I thought he would text me and say, oh, um, you know, text me when he's nearby and I'd meet him out the front. But he didn't text at all and he knocked on the door with flowers and I was very embarrassed. Turned out she had about six or seven of her friends uh, in her kitchen at the time all ready to go out that evening. So I had my own little Jerry Maguire moment of standing there in my, my nice clothes, my jacket with a bunch of flowers in my hands and I've got seven girls all looking at me. But uh, yeah, it was very cute to bring flowers to a first date and to knock on the door. I've never had that. <laughs> What I think I like most about it is that I didn't go looking for it. It just happened. It's an enormous challenge for a, a young woman like Kate to, to start seeing a guy like me who did not fall out of love with his wife. Uh, and I, I'm sure she's had friends tell her, you know, do you think this guy's OK, you know? Do you think he can really you know, give himself 100% to you. Initially, when we first started dating, I had reservations. I thought, can you really date someone and, and can they recover from something like this? You know, it's, it's so massive. Um, but the good thing with Matt is he'll talk about it. If I'm feeling a bit sort of adrift or just not quite... A good friend of mine said, you are allowed to love two women in your life, but it's still always there in the, in the background. And I do, I just pop over to the cemetery, just sit there, you know, talk to the air and tell Natalie what I'm up to and, and hope she's proud. I remember him telling me that, you know, when he leaves Nat's grave, he always says, oh, I've got to go. <laughs> I've got to go and live. Um, you know, and that's what he's doing. Natalie wanted me to have the chance to find happiness again. And in Kate, there's an enormous amount of happiness. So, yes, I think she'd approve. Kate, for the record, hates driving in the DeLorean. It's embarrassing to drive around the streets of Sydney. And people yell out about the flux capacitor and it um, hasn't got power steering, so it's a difficult car to drive. This car is never going to die. I think Kate's great and I think that anyone who has a space in their life for a Riley and say, yes, I'll, I'll come and, and join this Riley world, then I think, um, I think that says a great deal about her and her, um, her positivity. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah? I'm going to buy lots of caps. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't. Well, then you get your big meeting this afternoon. Go for cocktail. Yes. Go and get your green card. Kate and I moved to LA in January of 2015. Yeah. It doesn't hurt to yeah, take your little take package. Mm -hmm. Going to Los Angeles had the double benefit of immersing yourself in a different culture and creating new memories. See the Ooh. money. 
It's not Sydney. It's new for the two of us. A little piece of Australia, West Hollywood style. And uh, you might sense I have a slight accent, but I used to get so frustrated, no one understood what I was saying when I first moved here. <laughs> it's nice here. I like it here. Matt's 47 now. At age 10, he wanted to make big movies before being a writer, so he has had this kind of tunnel vision to do this job for a really long time. I'm so glad we moved, but I mean, it was a grind. He's had a lot of no's to get to this point. With Interceptor, for example, I asked him once, are you sure you have to direct it? And like, he was not happy that I asked that question. How many times are you gonna point out the Die Hard building? Like, I think it was Stu who got it made with Netflix. And quite rightly, Netflix were nervous for a first time director, but the fact that Stu and Matt partnered together, that really helped get the movie made. I'd like to make a movie where somebody goes, that's the, that's the building from the Matthew Ryan. <laughs> they said, will he be good? And I was like, yes, he'll be good. And he will listen, basically, because that, that's really what you want, someone to listen, especially when they're doing the job for the first time. If, if they think they know everything, then you're in real trouble. What Netflix do is they, they give you a, a chunk of money and they say, go make the movie. And amazingly, they let me direct it. The Hollywood star and wife of Chris Hemsworth, Elsa Pataki, is about to start filming her new blockbuster film called Interceptor in Sydney. Matt felt more comfortable working with Australians and Australian crews and things like that. So we were fortunate that we were able to make it work down here and, uh, you know, especially with COVID going on and everything. In our movie, uh, some bad guys decide to fire 16 nuclear missiles at 16 cities in the United States. This lady is all that stands in their way. <laughs> Gonna make their life a little bit complicated, right? To do that. <laughs> Storyboards from before, I'm preparing for the big crane shot. It was a huge victory just when he turned up that first day on set. All right, let's set it up. Let's give it a go. Matthew Riley here on the set of Interceptor, my first movie, and I guarantee it is as bonkers, fast, and action packed as any of the books, maybe even more so. Oh, yeah. I have been studying film direction for the last 30 years. We'll, we'll do a setup I actually have listened to so many movie commentaries that I have a little notebook filled with words of wisdom from Steven Spielberg, John McTiernan, and Martin Scorsese, all these major movie directors. So this wall will fly away and we'll be shooting most of the stuff in the Missile Command Center from this side looking that away. Matt came in with a very clear vision. He took to it like a duck to water. He loved it. Sometimes blind naivety is your best friend. You need such a Swiss Army knife set of skills to do it. Yeah, that's perfect. And I work my ass off. We could do that at the beginning of the day. So we he's got all these people like helping him realize this thing he's had in his head. Oh, so you could We took ideas from grips from catering, from sound, from everyone, everyone who had an idea, we would always be open to it and, and say, yeah, let's, let's consider that. Pause, get in position. For me to come in and go, I'm gonna change a few of your words. I mean, and what's that? Very well-respected, critically acclaimed writers. <laughs> um, coming from a guy that's never written anything in his life, really. So that was, um, I felt a bit strange, but they were so open to me doing that. You would, you would not let them see her. Matthew would come up and say, no screenwriting credit for you, even though I changed a few words most days. If you want to be a dictator and control everything in the story, write a novel. And I've done that for 23 years and I love that. With a film, you bring all these creative people into it and you collaborate. What do you put in a helicopter hangar? You put the stunt team. You get a built to scale replica of our command center, obviously built with cardboard boxes. When you film, a lot of the atmosphere comes from the director. He has time to see it if I wind up and she hurries it. He's got a, a real kid-like energy, so that really filters down through everyone. You know, they make me look good. I feel great. People say, are you enjoying it? What do you think about directing? I'm having a blast. I'm having a time in my life. <laughs> Oh, we're his greatest fans, and we know how hard he's worked to achieve this. Dream come true. Yes, thrilled. With two days to go, you get terrified that you've missed something, some shot that you're going to need to tell the story. 
But the other part is just how fleeting it is. It's, it, we build it, we film it, and then it's gone. I hope they let me direct more movies. If I can, you know, I'd love to sort of make a movie, write a book, make a movie, write a book. Matt will always write. He'll do it whether he has a book deal or not. He will do it, I think, until the day he dies because he actually enjoys the process of writing. I'm very envious of that internal engine, you know. We're, a lot of us are seeking approval to go, go and attack things. Matt has never needed that. Uh, I've been fortunate in, in so many ways and I've been unfortunate in other ways. And so all you can do is, is dig deep and keep throwing yourself back at it. If they write my headstone, it should say persistence. I think you could say the never give up message is the feature of every single story I've ever written. If you're a one trick pony, just keep doing that trick. A little bit differently, but better every time. And yeah, never say die is a Matthew Riley staple. So yeah, I built this model in, in 2017 before any producer was interested in the movie. Um, and because I'm an idiot, I thought I should make it 3D and do a, a model of the set. It's made to the scale of Star Wars figures because I obviously still have Star Wars figures. And this is what I built. There were times where I had grown adults moving these figures going, okay, they fight here and they tackle over here and she gets thrown through here and then they go over here and then they give you millions of dollars to make a movie. Ah.